Okay, hi everyone, welcome. I'm Noor, Code Pink's Palestine campaigner, uh, and welcome back to Missing Peace Mondays. It's been a while, I wasn't here last month, um, and that was our last one back after like a whole summer, so it feels really great to be here. Uh, we have a very special guest with us today, Rania Khalik. So um, we want to get right into it. Uh, so I'm going to pass it to Grace, who's going to go over our norms, uh, and then we'll get started. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you again all so much for being here. Yeah, I'm quickly going to go over our norms, um, especially today, since we have such an amazing uh, presentation. Oh. Okay, I'm first going to mute everyone because I think some people came on unmuted. Okay, awesome. Um, so I'm going to go over our norms and just a reminder that, yeah, we want to stay muted during the entire presentation. But I'm Grace, Code Pink's Digital Engagement Manager and Feminist Forum Policy Coordinator. Uh, we'd love for you to introduce yourselves in the chat, your name, location, if you're a returning Code uh, MPM member or you're new to the calls. Um, and then just a reminder to be respectful. This isn't a debate, but a discussion. Uh, we are not here to mediate arguments. We are here to learn from each other and take action for Palestine. Always be kind, always be curious. Um, and yeah, like I said, be ready to take actions. Also letting folks know this meeting is recorded since it's such an amazing uh, discussion and presentation we're gonna have. So please stay muted. And if you're uncomfortable with being on camera, uh, please keep your camera off and post your questions in the chat. We will have a Q&A later. Thank you so much. Thank you, Grace. Um, so like I mentioned today, our special guest is Rania Khalik. Rania is a Lebanese American writer, political activist, and journalist at Breakthrough News. Her work has appeared on Common Dreams, Salon, The Nation, In These Times, Citizen Radio, and a lot more. Her journey into journalism commenced in 2011 with Alternet, where she broke ground covering the Israeli occupation of the West Bank. She swiftly gained more prominence from 2012 to 2014 through her contributions to Truthout, further establishing her as a notable voice in progressive media circles. Rania, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, as a Palestinian, I just want to say how much I appreciate your work um, and the solidarity I feel you know, between us um, in this fight against Israel's terrorism that both of you know our people have experienced for way too long. Um, tonight, we're joined by many people who are here to learn and develop a deeper analysis of Israel's terrorism mm -hmm. on Lebanon, but you know, also a lot of people who are ready to take action and who have been taking action for over a year now. Uh, we have diligent organizers on this call who will benefit a lot from what you share with us today. So. Uh, let me not take any more time. Rania, can you share with us um, about, you know, Israel's terrorism in Lebanon, how it relates to Palestine, uh, the decades of resistance against Israel, and pretty much anything that you feel would be helpful to contextualize this moment we're in, what it took to get here, and how we can move forward and what you see for the future. It's a lot, but... You know, <laughs> Well, oh, no, no, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Noor. That was a really nice, kind introduction. And I appreciate what you said about solidarity here, because um, when it comes to the Levant, I mean, we've all been dealing with the same horrific issue and, you know, not just us, but our parents and our grandparents have been dealing with the same problem, the source <laughs> of so much of the violence in the region, uh, which is this imposition of this sectarian settler colonial apartheid genocidal state called Israel. Um, and I'll just make some comments about Lebanon and kind of putting this in the context of the broader struggle in the region. And I'm happy afterwards to maybe answer some very Lebanon specific questions because I know that people have spent the last year learning a lot about Palestine if they didn't already know or learning more than they already knew because of the genocide in Gaza um, and the uh, expanding violence, ethnic cleansing genocide that we're seeing in the West Bank. Um, but Lebanon is a part of this story too. Uh, you know, I, I do live in Lebanon. I'm not in Lebanon at the moment. I, I've been in the US. I came to cover the UN General Assembly and then uh, the upcoming elections. And I, I hope I can return. Um, but in my absence, the situation in Lebanon has deteriorated quite dramatically which started, I guess, now almost a month ago, maybe three weeks ago, a month ago, I can't even remember anymore, but it started with the pager attacks. Um, 
that then became walkie-talkie attacks, this terrorism that Israel inflicted across Lebanon that the media just was mesmerized by as some sort of act of ingenious uh, sabotage and booby trapping by the Israelis that killed a couple dozen people and injured thousands. And then after that came the carpet bombing in this in, in the South Beirut suburb. And then it and then came the carpet bombing across South Lebanon. And then came the assassination of Hezbollah's Secretary General Hassan Nasrallah with the U.S. dropping 85 bunker buster bombs. I'm sorry, the U.S., I should say Israel. It's a Freudian slip with Israel dropping 85 U.S. supplied 2,000 pound bunker buster bombs on residential buildings full of people, destroying six of them to kill the leader of Hezbollah. Um, something that, you know, we still don't know how many people were actually killed in those horrific, horrific a attacks, acts of terrorism. Um, and since then, Israel has attempted a ground invasion of Lebanon. Um, we're coming in about two weeks of that. Um, but like I said, I live in Lebanon. Um, and, you know, I've been watching this happening from outside, uh, which has been really horrifying because I've just been completely glued to the news, watching my home be destroyed, but also watching people fight back. Um, and before this recent escalation, we heard every single day in Lebanon for the, for the last year since last October that Israel wants to take us back to the Stone Age, copy and paste Gaza onto Beirut that they want to invade, ethnically cleanse, and colonize southern Lebanon and make it part of greater Israel, which is something they've tried to do repeatedly in the past. And they recently escalated in an attempt to do that. Um, and the reason I should add that they hadn't been able to before is because Lebanon has a really strong resistance, which is Hezbollah, which has repeatedly defeated Israel in the year 2000 after over a decade of, of occupation by Israel. Hezbollah liberated South Lebanon from Israeli occupation. I mean, Hezbollah exists because of Israeli occupation. It was formed in the mid-1980s to fight Israel's vicious invasion and occupation of Lebanon following its siege of, on Beirut, a siege that I should add Ronald Reagan referred to as a holocaust uh, when he asked uh, Menachem Begin to stop that siege. But anyways, Hezbollah went on to liberate South Lebanon in the year 2000 from Israel's vicious and brutal occupation and then pushed out an Israeli invasion again in the year 2006. And they have basically managed to protect the country ever since. And they're still doing it, even as Israel has unleashed hell on Lebanon since late September. And I mean, yesterday uh, we saw after, you know, Israel was convinced and the U.S. was convinced that because they killed Hassan Nasrallah and they wiped out Hezbollah's military leadership, that this meant that Hezbollah was degraded and they wanted to try to basically destroy it once and for all. But we've seen that Hezbollah has regrouped. Its command and con control is still intact. And yesterday they hit with a drone, a, an Israeli military base, um, and they killed four Israeli soldiers and injured several others, which, of course, you know, uh, the Israelis are calling an act of terrorism. But I just want to make a note that Hezbollah, which is classified as a terrorist organization by the U.S., has repeatedly targeted Israeli military installations since last October 8th to intervene against Israel's genocide in Gaza. They actually started that by firing at an Israeli military installation in the Sheba Farms, which isn't even Israeli land. It's Israeli-occupied Lebanese land. But I'm just saying that Hezbollah has repeatedly hit Israeli military installations, whereas Israel has repeatedly taken out residential buildings full of people. That is how Israel fights. That is their military doctrine. They intentionally target civilians to try to turn them against whatever resistance organization is fighting them uh, and to try to punish the population collectively. It's a blatant war crime. I mean, just this morning, the Israelis hit a building in an area of Lebanon called Zgarta, uh, which is actually a Christian majority area of Lebanon, which in solidarity with the people of South Lebanon has taken in displaced people from the South. And Israel has been hunting the displaced since all this started several weeks ago. It has repeatedly attacked buildings full of displaced people. And this morning it attacked a building in Zgarta, killing, I believe, 21 people um, who, again, had already had to leave their homes because of Israeli bombing. Um, so that is how Israel fights. 
uh, the most civilized and most moral army supposedly in the region and the world. I say that with great sarcasm in case anybody takes that out of context. Um, but anyways, that's all just to say that, you know, what Israel has been doing for the last several weeks has been trying to destroy Hezbollah and in, in the sense that they've been trying to destroy the way that they've been trying to destroy Hamas in Gaza. We've seen they have not been able to do that to Hamas in over a year now. Hamas is still fighting in Gaza, despite Israel having killed at this point probably hundreds of thousands of people, destroyed every single hospital in Gaza intentionally. Um, last night, we saw the horrific images of Israel literally burning people alive. Uh, and this is still going on. But I just, I, you know, as horrible and devastating as it is, we have to remember they have not met their military objectives in Gaza. So when they start talking about destroying Hezbollah in Lebanon, it's another military objective they will never, ever meet. Hezbollah is a significantly more powerful um, military group than, than Hamas is. And it's operating not in a small, densely populated, um, flat area the size of Gaza, but it's operating in a very diverse terrain of an entire country called Lebanon, uh, where it has a lot more geographic depth. And for the last two weeks, Israel has attempted to make its way into southern Lebanon and has repeatedly failed, being ambushed over and over again by Hezbollah, which is still capable of firing rockets. And, you know, this might make some people uncomfortable, but the reality is that Lebanon's future security at this point hinges on Hezbollah's performance in the south. That's the reality. Lebanon's, Lebanon has an army, but that army is intentionally made weak by the U.S. Um, it's funded by the Qataris and the U.S., completely dependent on those funds. Uh, the U.S. repeatedly has blocked the Lebanese government from purchasing uh, useful weapons for the Lebanese army, while it basically just gives the Lebanese army hand-me-down helicopters and hand-me-down night vision goggles that are all half broken and maybe some guns. That's it. The Lebanese army, unfortunately, is incapable of defending the country, which is why Hezbollah exists. So Lebanon's ability to maintain its territorial integrity and protect its sovereignty from Israel is completely reliant at this point on Hezbollah and whether it can you know, stop an Israeli invasion of the South, which so far it has been able to. And Lebanon does have the right to defend itself from an aggressive invasion by a settler colonial state. But I also want to put Lebanon in the context of Palestine here, because Israel has this project they've always wanted of greater Israel, where they want to occupy not just all of historic Palestine, but parts of Syria, parts of Lebanon, parts of Jordan, even parts of Iraq. And like I mentioned, they did occupy Southern Lebanon for a significant period of time. Um, and they do have a vision of wanting to do that again, at least the most right-wing people in their government do. Um, but this isn't just an Israeli project. I want, you know, we should make no mistake here. The Americans are in the driver's seat. Um, they tricked everyone with fake promises of a ceasefire in Lebanon, much like they did in Gaza, while greenlighting Israel's escalation to all-out war. And now, while the Israeli military tries to ruin the country to weaken Hezbollah militarily, the U.S. is squeezing the country politically. The U.S. is now demanding that a president of their liking be installed in Lebanon to force Hezbollah out of the Lebanese government, despite the fact that Hezbollah was elected to serve in the largest political bloc in Lebanon. Hezbollah is not just a military organization. It also has a political wing that has members of parliament. Um, it also has organizations that serve the communities they're elected to serve. And Israel is also using the fact that the U.S. classifies Hezbollah and its political wing as a terrorist organization to hit anything connected to Hezbollah politically, including the Islamic Health Authority, which just like every other political party in Lebanon, Hezbollah has an authority that provides medical care to people it serves. So Israel has been repeatedly hitting um members of the Islamic Health Authority, which is basically just like paramedics and medical personnel, in addition to also, by the way, hitting other medical personnel in hospitals across the country. Israel has so far in Lebanon alone killed over 100 medical personnel. 
Um, but just back to the what the U.S. is doing. This is the the 1982 script all over again, um, where the U.S. basically worked with the Israelis and the French to install a far right fascist president in Lebanon. He then quickly was assassinated, and that led to all kinds of massacres and uh, basically helped fuel the civil war that was already taking place in Lebanon. And I mentioned civil war here because a few days ago Netanyahu released a video statement to the Lebanese, giving them an ultimatum. He basically told them either kill each other in a civil war that attacks Hezbollah or Israel will turn Lebanon into Gaza. Um, and what Netanyahu is saying with a statement like that um, is that the U.S. and Israel want to literally ignite sectarian civil war in Lebanon. And how they do that is with their fascist allies in Lebanon, uh, groups like the Lebanese forces in Gitaib. And they do it. They're trying to do it using their media stations, one in particular called MTV. But these groups, these parties are fascist, like Christian parties in Lebanon, very sectarian. They played a role during the civil war in Lebanon. These are the parties that for any of you who know Palestine well, you've probably heard of the, Sh the Sabra and Shatila massacres. These are the two parties that together carried out the massacres in Sabra and Shatila, basically just massacring um, in the most brutal ways imaginable, raping unarmed women and children while the Israelis oversaw it and protected the perimeter of these refugee, Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon. Um, these are the groups that carry that out. And right now, these groups, the Lebanese forces and Kadeb, are jumping to serve their imperial masters in D.C. by inciting sectarian hate against displaced Lebanese Shias from the south. Um, these are the people who want Lebanon to be a sectarian Christian state that normalizes with the sectarian Jewish settler state. They basically want to literally hand over southern Lebanon to the Israelis to occupy, uh, which is exactly what the Israelis want. And so I, I just wanted to explain real quick where the U.S. fits into all this, because we need to understand Israel. And I think a lot of people here do, but I think it's worth reiterating since this is also about action, we need to understand Israel as a reflection of not a deviation from the U.S. A lot of people think the U.S. has gone crazy, right? They're willing to destroy this world order they've created and worked so hard for all to protect Israeli apartheid. But it's not just crazy. It's the U.S. gained something from this. We know that Israel is their weapon in the Middle East and even beyond. And, you know, Israel has participated in so many of the U.S. dirty wars around the world, particularly in the global South, doing much of the U.S.'s dirty work when the U.S. can't. I mean, a lot across Latin America, across Africa, this is what Israel does for America. That's why the Americans arm Israel to destroy Gaza, to bomb Lebanon, to kill Iranian nuclear scientists, to arm fascists in Latin America, to mow down international law. It's all to secure American interests in the region and around the world. Um, and we also know that these leaders in the U.S. and D.C. are quite racist. They don't see Palestinians and Arabs and Muslims as human. Um, and this is also a part of why they're supporting these crazy escalations. It's because of what October 7th meant to people like Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and Donald Trump and the people sitting in Brussels. It's because Palestinians in Gaza broke out of their cage, right? It was a prison break. Um, it was akin to a slave revolt. And as history has shown, no slave revolt goes unpunished. So these people sitting in Washington, they are punishing. They're using Israel to punish Gaza. They're backing the Gaza onslaught as part of a genocidal drive, not just against Gaza, but against all the oppressed people of the global south. They're sending a message that this is what happens if you strike back militarily against their rotten colonial imperialist system. So I really want us to see Israel versus Gaza and increasingly Israel versus Lebanon as the imperialist West versus the global the global South. They need to protect their system from collapsing by any means necessary. And they are high on a false victory right now. We hear rhetoric from the leaders in D.C. about reshaping the Middle East uh, in an image they prefer. That's why they want to go all in in Lebanon and are now fueling Israel in a potential war with Iran. They see an opportunity right now when every force in the Middle East, whether it's a country like Iran or the Yemenis or the Lebanese or the Palestinians or the Iraqis, all of these forces that are resisting and pushing back against American hegemony in the Middle East, 
They see an opportunity to take them all out because they seem weak at the moment. This kind of reshaping of the Middle East rhetoric that we hear from Biden and Jake Sullivan and Brett McGurk and Amos Hochstein is reminiscent of the way Condoleezza Rice was talking back in 2006 about the birth pangs of the of a new Middle East or the way the Bush administration was talking back in 2003 uh, ahead of the Iraq war. This is the same project. It's that neoconservative project. It's still in charge right now. Um, and I think this is our biggest uh, our biggest fight at the moment. If we continue to allow this escalation to go on with Lebanon, it's going to escalate into a war with Iran. Um, so I guess our role here in the Imperial Corps is to push back on that in all the ways that we can, all the ways that we have been, um, and, you know, on top of helping, you know, our our friends and our comrades in Palestine and Lebanon in the region in whatever way we can, you know, in terms of like humanitarian aid and all that stuff. It's also important to keep ourselves in the street and to keep learning about these issues and to understand that they are all connected. What is happening in Palestine is connected to what is happening in Lebanon. And again, it's going to snowball into a war with Iran. I don't just mean Israel and Iran. I mean, once that war starts, the U.S. will have to get involved. And it'll be another U.S. regime change war in the region. And sorry if I've been rambling for too long because there's just so much to talk about here, but I'm happy to answer any questions. No, it's great, honestly. Um, everything you share has honestly been so helpful. So whatever, however long you want to go is, is good with us. But we do uh, have some questions if we want to get into them. Um, the first is, and I know we talked about this a little bit, but what do you think is important um, for the people on this call, for the people taking action to understand about Lebanon specifically as we go forward um, in our protest and to end Israel's reign of terror throughout the world? I mean, a few things. Um, Lebanon's a bit more co complex than Palestine because it's obviously, um, it seems less straightforward because Lebanon is a country, right? It's not an occupied territory, a, a country in the sense that it's recognized by the UN as a sovereign country. It has a government and it's also a very polarized country. Um, so Lebanon is a, it has a lot of political parties in it. It has two main blocks that matter. There's the pro-resistance block and the pro-US anti-resistance block. And the pro-US anti-resistance block is full of the fascists I mentioned who work with the US to try to undermine Lebanon's ability to fight Israel. And these people want to normalize with Israel. They want to disarm Hezbollah so that Lebanon has no means of protection uh, against this aggressive settler state next door. Uh, and they want to normalize with Israel the way the Egyptians and the Jordanians have um, so they can just become another pro-U.S. client state in the region. Um, and But the, the thing is, in Lebanon, there are people who will suffer from that. Mostly the people of South Lebanon will suffer from that. And this is where a lot of you know, Hezbollah fighters come from. It's literally just Lebanese people defending their land from repeated invasion and occupation. Um, and they're never going to stop doing that. And this is these are the two basic polls in Lebanon. And the U.S. is trying to essentially, I mean, I guess what's most important to understand about what the U.S. is doing in Lebanon right now is they are working with a Lebanese group in the U.S. called the American Task Force for Lebanon, which is full of those sort of like right-wing fascistic minded allies of the U.S. in the country, but from here, and they are working with them to try to give cover for what they're doing, to try to act like they have Lebanese support for what they're doing. But the reality is that the vast majority of Lebanon is against this invasion. I'm not going to tell you that the vast majority of Lebanon supports Hezbollah. That's not true. But even those who don't are against this invasion and they are against Israel carpet bombing the country. And they want that to stop first and foremost. And they don't want the U.S. interfering in their politics and trying to use this opportunity to reshape the Lebanese political scene, which is what the U.S. is trying to do when it talks about Lebanon needs to hurry up and get a president. I mean, Lebanon does need a president, but the U.S. right now is trying to use this moment to get one that the U.S. likes so they can form a government that 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 basically leaves out Hezbollah. But I want to again say Hezbollah was elected to government. There are members of parliament who are in this political party. They represent hundreds of thousands of people in Lebanon. And so if you take them out of government, you are literally taking away the voices of hundreds of thousands of Lebanese people who support this party to represent them, which is quite anti-democratic. 
Um, so basically, the U.S. is trying to pull this like regime change scheme while Israel militarily tries to ruin the group. Um, and so I think that's really important to understand about Lebanon. It's also important to understand that Israel's ambitions in Lebanon, uh, they might not have as much of an attachment to it as they do to all of historic Palestine, but they do see South Lebanon as theirs. And if they are allowed to get what they want to disarm any ability of anyone in that region to defend their land, they will take it because they already have tried to do that in the past. So we cannot allow any attempted resolution to this conflict that includes Israel having a buffer zone that is language for occupation or that includes Israel, like when they talk about pushing Hezbollah back above the Latani River, they're essentially talking about pushing Lebanese people above the Latani River. Like it is not up to Israel where Lebanese people they don't like get to live. That's not their land. So those are things to, to keep in mind as we talk about Lebanon. I mean, I guess from an American perspective, we should not be okay with the U.S., imposing its political will on the government of Lebanon. Be wary of which Lebanese people you listen to on this issue if they're agreeing with the U.S. and giving cover to the U.S., uh, because we have a lot of those when it comes to Lebanon. Um, and we should not be okay with anything that resembles what Israel calls a buffer zone. It's just a code word for occupation. Thank you. And yeah, one of the questions were basically, how do the people of Lebanon feel about Hezbollah, which you um, answered a bit, but maybe um, what I'm thinking from this question, thinking about people's line of thinking, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about the way fragmentation of political parties is used as a tool against colonized people, like which I've seen a lot in Palestine, you know, fragmenting them there. And then sort of the place for that type of political discourse uh, for people in the U.S. and kind of how to not let that cloud, you know, our fight for liberation. Yeah, it's in the context of Lebanon, it's 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 actually been a country that's been easier to divide and conquer in many ways because it's, um, you know, not that Palestine was ever homogenous, but Lebanon has so so many different sects that have been turned on each other. Um, initially, the French, you know, after the British and the French decided to carve up the Middle East because that's what colonizers do, the French got Lebanon. The British got Palestine, right? Um, and the French idea in Lebanon was to create this Christian state. Um, and, and, and like I mentioned, in the in the sense of like you'd have a sectarian Christian Maronite run state in Lebanon, uh, right next to the Jewish sectarian apartheid state of Israel. That was like the British French vision for the region. Um, and there were people in Lebanon who were down with that. There was some very sectarian, mostly feudal leaders. Um who had a lot of land, who were down with that, but most Lebanese were not. And Lebanese is a, Lebanon is a very diverse uh, place. And, um, you know, the French kind of fueled sectarian conflict with that. And then with the Lebanese Civil War, war it got even worse. The Lebanese Civil War, it's often presented as just like, Ara you know, the Arabs of Lebanon started like killing each other because one was Muslim, one was Christian. That's not actually what happened. The Lebanese Civil War was an imperialist war on Lebanon that was an attempt to use fascist sectarian forces in Lebanon to put down uh, resistance to Israel's occupation of Palestine because Israel's founding obviously created a lot of Palestinian refugees that were dispersed throughout neighboring countries, including Lebanon, and they tried to go back to their land. Israel wouldn't let them. Eventually, like anybody would, they took up arms and formed resistance organizations to fight for their land back. And so you had the PLO based out of Lebanon uh, in the 70s, and you had leftist Arab militias in Lebanon that formed in solidarity and fighting with the PLO. Also, throughout the beginning of Israel's existence, the first few decades, they would just go into southern Lebanon whenever they felt like it and like kill people and kidnap people and do whatever they wanted. That happened, you know, always. Um, and so resistance formed to that as well. And so the civil war in Lebanon was mostly again, the US, the French, and the Israelis arming, funding, and training these fascist sectarian forces to fight, to start a, a war with the PLO and to and, and the various Arab leftist militias. And that's how it began. And then uh, and it culminated in two Israeli invasions, one in 1978, one in 1982. And this is where people get the idea of like Christians and Muslims fighting each other because the US and Israel back, and France backed these fascist Christian sectarian organizations uh, to put down the left.
to put down resistance. Uh, and that went on for a while. And eventually they kind of did put down the left. Uh, they did force the PLO uh, out. Um, they had to like leave to Tunisia. And that's when Sabra and Shatila were left defenseless. And that's when those fascist forces came in and massacred all those people. And then eventually Hezbollah was formed. But anyways, all that's to say... Lebanon, after the civil war, had this agreement that would basically disperse power to all the different sects so they could have representation in government. Um, and this has led to a state of sec like sectarian parties and clientelism that keeps them going. Um, and Lebanon, as a result, has this sort of fragile makeup that is constantly afraid of a reignited civil war because it's not that hard to reignite a civil war in Lebanon because it is a very segregated country. Like a lot of neighborhoods are like, that's a Shia neighborhood. That's a Sunni neighborhood. That's a Christian neighborhood. That's a Christian Maronite neighborhood. That's an Orthodox Christian neighborhood. That's a Druze neighborhood. That's that's how most of Lebanon lives and fits. And so right now, one thing that's really, really troubling is that Israel and its carpet bombing, which has mostly targeted Lebanese Shia villages, because that's Hezbollah's base, is Lebanese Shias, um, has displaced 1.2 million people in Lebanon. This is a country of less than 6 million people. So you're talking about a fifth of the country being displaced, a country that's already been experiencing an economic collapse, um, and that's been dealing with a lot of internal problems over the last seven or eight years. Um, so it's already in a fragile state with a government that's weak, a state that's weak, that's unable to care for people to begin with, let alone in a catastrophe like this. There are displaced people kind of all over the country right now. And part of the Israeli mentality on this is that is is that this will basically fuel sectarian hatred of Shias. Um, and that's one of the reasons that Israel has been, tr has been bombing the displaced, even in my village, by the way, uh, there's someone in my village who received a phone call from the Israelis saying, if the people who are displaced don't leave your house right now, we will bomb your home. So there's this attempt to try to make non-Shia areas scared to house the displaced because then they'll be targets. And, you know, it's worked in a couple places, but for the most part, it hasn't worked. That said, how long is this sustainable? How long is this sustainable? It's one thing if it's a month, but once you've got what, if this goes on for three months, if it goes on for five months and you have over a million people displaced across the country, um, you do risk the potential for sectarian violence. It's just, it's like, it, it might happen. And you also, again, you have, you have fascist media outlets funded by billionaires aligned with the Lebanese forces, uh, like the outlet MTV, that's also fueling this hatred of Shias, fueling this belief that these displaced Shias are all actually Hezbollah and they're going to get your neighborhood bombed. They are saying these things. And I know for a fact, people in the Lebanese government are scared to shut that station down because then the Americans will come to them and say, oh, you're you're listening to what Iran's telling you to do. So the, that accusation is stopping them. But anyways, all that's to say, these are the kinds of... Um, concerns I have when it comes to that divide and conquer in Lebanon. And I guess that we here should be cognizant of that um, because of the fact that that's what people are, I think, most worried about as Israel continues this campaign. In addition to the fact that Israel's trying to invade the country and is bombing residential areas, people are very scared about the potential for civil war. And so I think our role here is to make sure that we don't fall into the trap of like, playing into any of that sectarian hatred because it could easily happen accidentally. It kind of happened a little bit with the Syrian civil war. I hope it doesn't happen here again in the context of Lebanon. Yeah, totally agree. I'm, I mean, here in the U.S., we have a goal, um, you know, to support the people of Lebanon and Palestine. Um, and definitely not the way to do that is not to create fragmentation among ourselves here in the U.S. Um, but we have a lot of questions. So moving on, somebody asks, can you explain or expand on the United Nations interim force in Lebanon placement on the border? So grateful to know they're there, but these grave violations and unleashing violence on them, will that have repercussions? Yes, so I do. I do. No, no, I do believe that will have repercussions. I think we're seeing some of it now. So UNIFIL is a force that is supposed that there are these UN peacekeepers from like 50 different countries. Uh, someone can correct me if I'm wrong on that, but from many, many countries around the world, um, they, I think they number in like seven or 800 of them or something. Um, and they're stationed at the border between Israel and Lebanon. Uh, but they're actually only stationed on the Lebanese side of the border uh, because um, everything is unfair when it comes to agreements with Israel. And the, their role is to basically keep the peace, but only on the Lebanese side of the border where they're supposed to like 
make sure that there aren't armed people who are firing, I guess, um, and man their positions and basically observe and basically observe and just kind of be there as like middlemen. Um, and I, they are basically given the power they have, I believe, by the UN Security Council. So there, none of them are American, but a lot there's a lot of European countries that contribute to UNIFIL, um, as well as other countries around the world, like Indonesia has people, for example. Um, but they have their stations, they have their observation posts um, on the Lebanese side of the blue line, as it's called. Um, and Israel has been trying to invade the country and sees them as an obstacle to doing what they want. We know that Israel hates the UN. They basically spent the last year and even before actually, but really the past year trying to discredit the UN, um, as an institution, uh, so that it can't ever stand in the way of anything Israel does. Not that it really does, but it has the potential to, um, and we've seen them kill UN workers in Gaza, um, I don't even know the number, but I'm sure it's over a hundred. Um, we've seen the Israeli ambassador go to the UN and call the UN an agent of Hamas um, and repeatedly attack this body. So they recently, since they started trying to invade Lebanon, have been firing at these UNIFIL soldiers, these peacekeepers, as they're called, um, and storming their bases, and they want them to leave. Um, I imagine one reason they might want them to leave is they don't want them there to observe anything, uh, is one. Uh, there, two, is Israel is very hostile to the UN in general and doesn't like them and likes to kill them, likes to kill their employees. Um, and, you know, they also stand in the way of Israel uh, basically being able to fire at will as it pleases um, at, at you know, uh, villages. I mean, Israel's literally just firing into civilian villages and destroying homes and demanding that they all evacuate. Um, and so what's different about UNIFIL than UNRWA is UNIFIL has the mandate of the UN Security Council, and it has these soldiers from all over the global north. So that's why you see condemnations coming from European countries. That's why you see even Germany saying this is not okay for Israel to be firing at these people and they will absolutely stay. Another reason to keep to, to for Israel to want them to leave is because Israel wants to basically create a buffer zone that they can ultimately occupy southern Lebanon. Um and, and the UN peacekeepers kind of stand in the way of that a little bit. Uh but anyways, yeah, this does change the game a little bit. Like you've seen more condemnation from the Europeans and even to some degree the U.S. than you have seen for killing over 2,000 people, so killing over 2,300 civilians in Lebanon in the past uh, in the past year, most of them in the last three weeks, uh, because these are their citizens. Um, and so I think the more that Israel does attack this particular organization, the more it's going to isolate the Israelis. Thank you, Rania. Um, and the next question: uh, the majority of Congress seems clueless. Not part of the question, but. I don't want to leave that part out. Uh, do you think the Senate's joint resolutions of disapproval um, that have been led by Bernie Sanders to stop weapon sales to Israel um, have a chance or have sort of a bearing on our activism moving forward? I think any bill in any part of Congress that is calling for giving Israel less weapons or taking Israel's weapon away, weapons away is important. Will it pass? I mean, you know the Congress we have better than I do as Code Pink. Um, you guys are there all the time you know, getting in the faces of these members of Congress who are all getting money from APAC. So I think you actually know better than I would. I don't have very much faith that we can rely on our Congress to, Congress to anytime soon do that. Um, but I don't think it means you stop pushing for it because eventually there will be a snowball effect and there will come a time when that has to happen, just like with apartheid South Africa. Um, in the meantime, you know, I think we need to be start asking for bigger things. We should start demanding members of Congress don't give money for the Iron Dome. I mean, the Iron Dome is something that is considered a defensive mechanism for Israel. We shouldn't call it defensive. There's nothing defensive about it. The Iron Dome is part of a three-layer air defense system that the U.S. largely funds and supplies to Israel to protect it from the consequences of committing genocide. It is not okay that Lebanon has zero air defenses and the U.S. stops Lebanon from accessing air defenses from countries like Russia, for example. Um, well, Gaza has zero air defenses. The West Bank has zero air defenses. It's now being subjected to airstrikes. Meanwhile, the Israelis get three layers of air defenses to protect them, not just their civilians, but to protect their military bases from any consequences to committing genocide. At this point, Israel's military bases, particularly where their fighter jets are stationed, are the equivalent of those train tracks to Auschwitz. 
I, and I really mean that I'm not trying to be hyperbolic here, here and anything protecting those train tracks is actually completely offenses offensive and is a part of the genocide. So the iron dome, as far as I'm concerned, is a part of that genocide. And any congressperson who claims to be progressive in any way whatsoever should not be voting for it. And that includes AOC. I know I went on a tangent there, but I just, I'm really sick of the fact that Lebanon just has like nakedly able to be bombed with 2000 pound US bunker buster bomb on families while the Israelis get three levels of air defenses to stop anybody, anybody from exacting material consequences on them to make them stop their genocide. Uh, actually, I appreciate that tangent because I think it embodies why JRDs are important in the first place because it sparks discussion like this, you know, hopefully in Congress, but even among, you know, the American people to talk about, you know, these discrepancies in the way the U.S. shelters Israel while, you know, then deeming acts of resistance as terrorism from countries like Lebanon. Um, so actually that tangent I think was, was great. Um, so the next question is, uh, people are interested in hearing about the Hariris and if you can talk about <laughs> them and. Oh, my gosh. OK, so, I mean, the Hariri family is a feudal family in Lebanon. There are many of them. Um, they actually also have Saudi citizenship. But if the Hariri was like the prime minister of Lebanon for a very long time uh, after the Civil War. And um, he basically helped neoliberalize Lebanon. I, I wish I could send you to resources to read about that, but I can't think of any off the top of my head. Um, but, you know, these neoliberalization schemes throughout the 90s that were put on much of the global South, Hariri was like uh, an important proponent of that um, across Lebanon after the Civil War, made a lot of money as a result, more money than he already had, and also worked a lot on behalf of the Saudis in the country. Everybody loves to talk about Iran, 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 and their malicious and malign interference everywhere, but they never say anything about the Saudis or the other Gulf states or the Americans themselves in Lebanon. Um, so Hadidi was, you know, assassinated. We actually still don't know who assassinated him, but everybody has a theory. The opponents of Hezbollah blame Hezbollah. Hezbollah vehemently denies that they had anything to do with his assassination in 2005. Um, and, uh, you know, they Say they don't they didn't have anything to gain from it some people think the saudis were responsible some people a lot of people think the israelis were responsible but actually recent revelations came out in the last several weeks that the um international tribunal to investigate the assassination of Had Rafi al hariri which is still i think ongoing actually or if it's not it ended a few years ago I, I don't remember but that that was actually used that tribunal was used to collect information about lebanon particularly Hezbollah, that actually was then given to the Israelis. And that was some of the intelligence that they used to basically target uh, the people they've targeted in the last month in Lebanon. Um, so just something to think about. Um, and that, there was a really good article about that in El Akhbar, which is a Lebanese newspaper that was translated in something called The Public Source, if anybody wants to go check that out. It exists in English. It was written by Alman Nishabi, um, who is a really good, like, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of when you investigate, like, crime Forensic. He does forensic analysis. Anyways, uh, so that's Rafi al-Hariri. After he was assassinated, his son, um, and he was in charge of a party, his son, Saad Hariri, uh, took charge of sort of like the Sunni community in Lebanon through this party called the Future Movement. Um, that's part of the March 14 alliance that is the basically like anti-resistance alliance in Lebanon that is aligned with the U.S. Uh, it includes in it those fascist parties I mentioned earlier, like Lebanese forces and Kadeb uh, and some others. Um, and Saad Hariri was kind of an agent of the Saudis throughout his tenure in Lebanon. Um, but ultimately, Hezbollah became such a powerful force politically that he managed to find a kind of like working relationship with him. But since then, he's sort of become a defunct politician. He's not in charge of anything anymore. The Saudis gave up on him. And you'll even remember when MBS arrested all those people back in, I think it was 2018, um, 2017 20, or 2018, MBS arrested all these people in Saudi Arabia that were like opponents of him or that he views as potential opponents. One of the people he arrested was Saad Hariri, who he then tortured and forced to get on camera and resign as prime minister. And it, he looked really scared in that resignation. It looked like he was kind of at gunpoint. Um, and then he undid that resignation after he left Saudi Arabia because he did it under duress. Uh, but anyways, all that's to say, he doesn't really matter as a, as a figure in Lebanon anymore because 
he's not in charge of anything at this point. And the Sunni community in Lebanon, there's a power vacuum. And one of the one of the concerns that the U.S. has as a result of that power vacuum is that they are turning more pro-resistance again because Hari was very anti-resistance, anti-Shia, therefore anti-Hezbollah. But the Sunni community in Lebanon is becoming pro-resistance, um, is becoming, you know, is supporting Hamas uh, and groups like the Muslim Brotherhood in Lebanon who are joining with Hezbollah to resist Israel and actually undoing a lot of the sectarianism that the U.S. helped instill over the last decade um, against Shias in the region. So that's just something to keep an eye on. But yeah, right now, Saad Hadidi doesn't really matter. And neither does his family. Thank you. Yeah. Um, a lot of curious questions. So sometimes just the extra information is good. Um, this will probably be our last question. I think it's a good way to end. Um, somebody asked, how can one not be cynical? And I was thinking this might be a good time. Uh, maybe if you want to talk about Yom al-Muqawama with the Harir, the Day of Resistance and Liberation. Um, if you want to talk about a prison break, that was that was a real prison break. Um, yeah. Well, actually, you know what I want to say about cynicism? Because I think it's really easy. And I get I get like this too. I think what we're seeing is so horrifying and it, it just seems to keep getting worse. Like we've never seen anything this bad in our entire lifetimes. And I'm not just saying my lifetime, people who are twice my age, I don't think you've seen anything as bad as what we've witnessed over the last year. And again, just keeps getting worse and it seems to be spreading and it's scary. And it's like, we've been out in the streets for a year. We've been Go, you know, getting in the faces of members of Congress for a year. We've been teaching for a year. We've been informing people for a year. The majority of the American public supports a ceasefire. Um, an increasing number of the American public supports an arms embargo, but it's not reflected in our leadership. And then we have these two different flavors of genocide to choose from in this upcoming election. And it, it does sometimes feel really hopeless. Um, and, and we and it leads to a feeling of helplessness. But what I want to say is that, yes, there's been October 7th and many other prison breaks that are very important to remember. But I think what's most important to remember at this point in time is that there are people who are fighting in the most dire of circumstances in Gaza, first and foremost in Gaza, first and foremost in Gaza. But every single day, they're still fighting. They're still exacting casualties. They're doing it from under tunnels. They're doing it by treating patients. I'm not just talking about armed resistance here, though that, that's important to remember. I'm talking about people who are still trying to help their people in these circumstances. They are doing it amidst genocide. In Lebanon, they are doing it amidst sanctions and amidst carpet bombing and amidst displacement. They are still resisting. So when we feel helpless here, we have to remember that people there have almost nothing and they are still fighting. So we have no excuse not to be doing it here. And most importantly, we have power here. We have power in this country. This is the source. This country is the source of all of this violence. U.S. imperialism is the source of all of this violence. I keep doing this. I keep plagiarizing Vijay Prashad, a very good friend of mine and a, an amazing comrade. But I do it because it's important. Vijay always says, um, he always tells the story about Ho Chi Minh uh, during the Vietnam War and how these Italian comrades went to go visit Ho Chi Minh. And they asked him, you know, tell us what we can do to help the cause, the struggle. How can we help? And he told them, you can help by going home and doing revolution there because your country is the problem. And that, that applies to us. That applies to us in America. This country is the problem. We have to change the way this country functions because the only way Palestine gets liberated isn't just resistance from there, but if the people sending the weapons from here stop, it's like that is of the utmost importance. So I just, I always want to emphasize that we have to keep doing everything we can here, even when it feels like it's not meaningful or isn't helping because it is helping because ultimately everything leads to the, the, the ultimate liberation of this people. I mean, look, look how long South Africa took, look how long Vietnam took. This is a long struggle. It's going to take longer, but I really do believe we are witnessing the beginning of the end of Zionism. Israel is not a sustainable country. It's not a sustainable military base for the U.S. It's a shrinking country. Hezbollah has shrunk that country. It is like no one can live in the north anymore. It's a, it, it, People are leaving. Nobody wants to like live in a country that's constantly, especially if you're not indigenous to it, that is constantly being 
showered with missiles from Iraq and from Yemen and Lebanon and Gaza. Who wants to live like that? Only a crazy person wants to live like that. And that's why it's a country full of crazy people who at some point will need to talk about denazifying. But in the meantime, we cannot lose hope because people over there have not lost hope. So I think everyone, I just, everyone that is on this call, I know you guys are doing that work. You guys are doing the organizing and the lobbying and the pushing members of Congress and the getting in the streets. You have to keep doing that. Do not give up on that. Even if it looks like it's so bad and we're losing and Palestine is losing, it's not losing. It'll never lose. It hasn't lost in 76 years. It's just going through its most difficult point in time today. But again, we actually in this country collectively have the power to change that. And we change it by doing everything that you guys are doing here. But just like over there, the worse it gets, the harder the resistance gets over here, the worse it seems to get, the more you have to multiply the resistance. And everything you're doing here, you multiply it by 10, you multiply it by 100. And there are more people who want to join. You guys know better than I do. I'm sure Code Pink and the people involved in coming to Code Pink events has grown dramatically in the last year. So all that's to say, keep doing what you're doing and become more militant about it. Become more, more aggressive about it. Do it more. Do it more and with more passion. Thank you, Rania. Um, okay, so that was the last question, but one more quick one. Um, where can people, you know, stay in tune uh, with your perspective, stay updated, and feel free for to shamelessly plug because this is your opportunity. Yes. <laughs> so I will shame. I will absolutely plug my. Well, you can follow me at Rania Kalik on all social media platforms. But most importantly, follow my outlet Breakthrough News. It's at BT Newsroom on on social all social media platforms: Twitter, Instagram. Um, and, and, and TikTok, uh, and also on YouTube, make sure you follow us on YouTube, but there, I host a show there called dispatches, uh, where I do long form interviews with really awesome people who know what they're talking about. Um, and if you want to follow the news in the region, um, there are a lot of resources to do that on telegram. So I just want to plug, cause I know it's a lot, it can be hard to find news in English, um, from like you know, that from my perspective, let's say, or people who think like me, um, there are things like El Akhbar English has a really, really good telegram channel. That's El Akhbar, A-L-A-K-H-B-A-R English on telegram, where they even um, translate some of their really, really good articles. It's the largest leftist newspaper in Lebanon and has a really good perspective. You can follow El Mayadeen English, um, which is very pro-resistance, but, you know, it kind of gives you that injects you with that viewpoint, which is necessary uh, when, you, when you're just like constantly being inundated by the New York Times and CNN. Um, I, you know, if you wanna just get the Hezbollah perspective, you can follow El Manad English on Telegram that gives regular updates, particularly about what they're saying. And I know people probably already follow things like Resistance News Network, but if you don't, I mean, they translate pretty much every statement uh, by every, uh, resistance organization across the region, whether it's the Yemenis or the Iraqis or the Lebanese or the Palestinians, um, into English, which is important to follow because they update you on all of their operations and why they're doing what they're doing. I mean, things that you're just not going to see in the mainstream media. Um, and anyways, Telegram is your friend in this case because a lot of those viewpoints are ignored. But also, if you're on Instagram, you can follow Lebanon News. There's a lot of really, really good uh, pages like eyes on South Lebanon. Um, and also literally just go to my Instagram and look at who I'm just look up Lebanon, look up who I'm following and put in the light word Lebanon and you'll find a bunch of really cool, um, and different like pages to follow. Cool. Thank you so much, um, for answering all those questions and thank you for being here today. You answered everything so eloquently and so, uh, clearly. So thank you so much for being here and thank you everybody for, uh, submitting questions for Rania to answer. Uh, but before I pass it to Grace to close this out, I just want to talk to you all about this petition, ask you to sign it. Um, so Code Pink has been working with Dawn, which is Democracy for the Arab World Now. Um, and they've been doing some great work getting settler groups um, in Palestine sanctioned. So um, as you all may know, there are you know, violent settlers, violent settler groups who perpetuate land theft in Palestine and pretty much are there to terrorize Palestinians on a near daily basis. Um, and Don has actually been successful in getting some settler groups and individuals sanctioned. Um, so 
all this week, starting tomorrow, Code Pink and Don are going to be meeting with members of Congress to get them to pressure Biden to uh, sanction Israeli settler groups in Palestine. Um, and this is really important because we'll have actual tangible results for people who sign this petition for the people of Palestine. Um, because what these sanctions do in a lot of cases, first of all, actually, you know, explore the idea of accountability for those who perpetuate the occupation of Palestine. But in a lot of cases, it cuts the funding of these settler groups from, you know, the American nonprofits that are often funding them. So they're cut from their funding um, and they have significant barriers in place um, so that they can, you know, stop terrorizing Palestinians. So that is going to be happening all this week and um, in the near future. So please sign it as soon as you can and send it to a friend, your family, anybody else who might sign it. Um, because, you know, this public pressure could be the push that they need to, you know, actually move towards some real accountability. So I just wanted to put that all on your radar. Um, thank you all again for joining. Thank you, Rania, and I'll pass it to Grace. Thank you so much. Um, we cannot be more grateful for everybody being here. Um, and we could not be more grateful to Rania for always providing such important insight into Lebanon, but also into movement building and solidarity work. Uh, I've also been thinking a lot about VJ talking about bringing the revolution to where you are. And we are just very grateful to everybody on this call for doing the local work to bring down Zionism, to bring down genocide, to bring down the war machine, um, and to create local peace economies where you're at. So I'm going to ask you all to please mark your calendars for our next Missing Peace Monday on uh, November 11th. As a reminder, we have moved to a monthly format so we can bring you amazing uh, content like Rania and, and discuss our own local work and what we can be doing for Palestine. Um, and we are also bringing this movement, this movement for peace, to women's marches throughout the country on November 2nd. We will not let feminism be co-opted by the war machine, by genocide, and by imperialism, just like we do in our own uh, communities. We already have marches in DC, in New York City, and LA, and more being added each day. So I would love for you guys to head over to our landing page of all the marches happening and some amazing webinars having before that, talking about the co-option of feminism and how to practice our anti-imperial feminist values um, every day. And especially as we are going into a season where feminism is being so co-opted by the war machine. But I wanna thank everybody for being here, for sticking around, for sending in amazing questions. We'll see you next month. Have a great night. Bye, Thank everyone. Thank you.